Welcome to another podcast episode of DIY Guitar Making. I also produce video episodes of DIY Guitar Making live in the workshop. To find both the podcasts and the videos all in one place, go to DIYGuitarMaking.com. You can even subscribe to the email list there to receive new episodes, both the videos and the podcasts, directly in your inbox as they come out. Again, that's DIYGuitarMaking.com. And with that, let's get to the show. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. I've got a great topic for you today. We're going to be talking about buying equipment for your small guitar making shop. We're going to talk about band saws, table saws, thicknessing equipment, various sanders that are used for shaping, router table setups, the drill press, and the jointer. This is a big episode. There's a lot to get into. And furthermore, this is really just the start. In future episodes, I'm going to cover hand tools and uh, other tooling that you'll need for guitar making and even jigs and things like that. I couldn't fit it all into one episode, so we're starting with just stationary power equipment. So we're going to talk today about the various pieces of equipment that one might need for guitar making. Now, when we talk about equipment, it's important for me first to clarify what I mean by equipment. So when I think of equipment, I'm thinking of stationary power tools, okay? Let's take a handsaw, for example. A handsaw is neither a power tool nor is it stationary because you hold it in your hand and carry it around and make saw cuts with it. A handheld plunge router, on the other hand, is also not a piece of equipment because it's a power tool. However, it also is not stationary. Stationary power equipment are things like band saws, table saws, thickness sanders, spindle sander, etc., on and on. And so since we've now defined what we mean by equipment, let's now talk about your budget. So your budget, the amount of space you have, and the amount of use that you expect these pieces of equipment to encounter over their life all of that is going to play a part into your decisions here. So I can't give any blanket recommendations on exactly what is going to work best for you in your situation. You might be a weekend warrior who's building one guitar a year, or you might be a guy who's batching out 40 guitars a year. Those are completely different scenarios. This might be a career for you where the expenses incurred from the equipment can be justified by the profits that you take from your work, or it could all be a total loss if you are doing this just as a hobby, say, for fun, which I know a lot of you are. But let me at least give you just one general rule that you can apply to purchasing equipment, and it's a general rule that honestly I use in all areas of my life when I'm making a purchasing decision, more or less. I mean, sometimes I break this rule. It's a general rule, and that's Never to buy the cheapest thing. And I know that hearing this hurts some of your ears, specifically the people who purchase Harbor Freight tools. Stop doing that. Don't buy the bare bones cheapest thing. I'm not saying buy the most expensive thing either. I'm literally just saying buy the second cheapest thing. When in doubt, when you don't know what to do, Um, when there's throwing so many different features and numbers at you and you just can't make a purchasing decision, at least don't buy the cheapest thing. The cheapest thing never, ever lasts, okay? There's usually really good value in the next level up, just that second tier. Going up from there, you're usually paying for diminishing returns or things that really only matter to, again, someone who's Uh, basically manufacturing guitars at a pretty high level. So keep that in mind, guys. Uh, I know you Harbor Freight people are mad at me right now, but you're just being cheap. Stop it. (laughs) 
And I know so, what some of you are thinking right now. Hey, Eric, I am only using this one time. I'm, I just want to build this one guitar to say I did it and to have this family heirloom. And then I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm probably not going to build any other guitars. Well, then, honestly, I think buying the tool for most of this equipment is, is for rough mill work anyway. Buying the tool for this is just not the right solution for you. You can simply buy the material, the part itself, already, say, pre-thicknessed or pre-bent or pre-joined. Um, there's actually a lot of ways that you can buy guitar parts nowadays, especially uh, from Luthier's Mercantile is really good with this. You can, when, when you purchase parts from Luthier's Mercantile, and I think maybe from some other places too, they do a similar thing, you can also purchase services meaning you can ask them to thickness these plates to, say, um, 110 thousandths of an inch or whatever you request. That seems like a way better solution than buying some piece of junk drum sander to do the job one time. Furthermore, if you really want to do it yourself, which I understand, there are still other ways to go about it. You can find somebody else who owns this equipment or even... Um, shops that will charge you by the hour to come in and use their equipment. So just consider that. Think outside the box. You don't need to buy everything, especially if you're on a budget and you're going to buy something from Harbor Freight anyway. Harbor Freight and companies like it have mastered the art of the one-time use disposable tool. Okay, so that was my section on slandering Harbor Freight. Uh... Let's move on from there. So now on the flip side of things, if you're looking at the high end of things, for a lot of people, you're not actually going to capture the value in a high-end machine because a lot of that value is simply in its longevity and its durability over the course of uh, a long time and with heavy use. If you're the type of person who's not going to be putting this machine through the ringer on a fairly regular basis, then you might not actually be capturing the value. So I'll give you an example. I have a Resaw King bandsaw blade. It's just the blade, not the whole bandsaw. And that blade is $150. Yes, $150 just for the bandsaw blade, but for me, it's totally worth it. I use that blade for resawing. Um, it sees extremely heavy use. It has never broken or worn down in the very long time that I've had it and through the heavy usage that I put it through. However, if you are going to be resawing plates minimally or even not at all, then just getting an economy blade is totally fine because that economy blade, if you're using it gently, might also never break. So if you invested in the $150 Resaw King bandsaw blade with your light use, you wouldn't actually be capturing the value of that product. Now, if you're buying a high-end piece of equipment for some of the cool features that it has, like adjustable fences and lasers and things like that, then that's a different story. And if you can afford it and you desire it, great. We just want to avoid looking at a high price tag and assuming that this piece of equipment was designed for someone like you because it might have very well been designed for a completely uh, just different level of use than what you're capable of doing. So just do your research, guys. Um, and don't worry, we're going to get into the specifics of different pieces of equipment in just a moment here, I have one more little tip for you, and that's, uh, of course, to check out used equipment. That is a, a great, that's how I've found a lot of my machines. I got my edge sander from a neighbor down the road, actually, who does chainsaw carvings, interestingly enough. And um, he was having a yard sale, and so I bought his edge sander, which works great. And actually, as I'm recording this podcast right now, just two houses down the road from me, there is a sign for an auction that just went up. And on the auction sign, it lists as the number one thing they're selling, 
shop tools. So I'm very interested in checking that out and seeing uh, maybe I'll get something there. Um, maybe it'll be a bunch of junk that I don't need. But either way, I'm going to check that out because that's where you can find some really good value. All right, so some of the equipment that I'm going to talk about here. These are all pieces of equipment that fit well in a guitar maker's shop. It's not all 100% necessary. There are always workarounds, but these are all important considerations. So let's go through the list. We're going to talk about the bandsaw, the table saw, something for thicknessing. That could be a planer, a drum sander, a heavy-duty thickness sander, or some combination of those. We're going to talk about sanders for shaping. So there's a variety of those. There's belt sanders, edge sanders, spindle sanders. We're going to talk about having a router table set up. We're going to talk about the drill press, and we're going to talk about the jointer. Okay, we're going to talk about the bandsaw first, because the bandsaw really is the most important piece of equipment in a luthier's shop. If I had to sell all of the other pieces of equipment in my shop, and I would had to just get by with just my hand tools and uh, some of my other non-stationary tools, but I can only keep one piece of equipment, it would, without a doubt, be the bandsaw. That is the one thing I would highly recommend that everyone invests a good portion of whatever your budget is for the entirety of your tooling. Um, what you're doing with the bandsaw, make it count. My bandsaw, actually I have two bandsaws. I have two bandsaws and they're both centrally located in the shop because I use them that much. I haven't spent that much on either of them. They're both under $600. Again, not counting the expensive um, Resaw King bandsaw blade that I use with it. But the actual equipment, they're both individually under $600. I have a Jet 10-inch bandsaw and a 14-inch Craftsman bandsaw. The reason I have two, and this really is a pro tip here that won't apply to most people... Of course, you, most people don't need to buy two bandsaws. But the pro tip here is if you find yourself changing bandsaw blades a lot, which takes a considerable amount of time to change and set up all the various guides and everything like that for the bandsaw every time you change a blade, um, just get two bandsaws, make the investment, and have one bandsaw permanently hold a large, in my case, three-quarter of an inch resawing blade, and the other bandsaw is just permanently set up with a much smaller quarter-inch blade. The only time I need to change a blade is when a blade breaks, and that happens very rarely and only really on the, the quarter-inch blade. The Again, that $150 Resaw King blade is just indestructible. But the two-bandsaw trick is really a tip for the seasoned um, professional here. If you're new to guitar making, obviously you're not going to buy two bandsaws. So let's just talk about getting one bandsaw. And that's what I did too, by the way. I started out for the longest time with my one bandsaw, swapping out the blades as needed. And hey, it's good practice to have to set up your bandsaw with the guides and the tracking every single time. You learn a little bit about operating your machine that way. So the important thing to know about purchasing a bandsaw for a guitar maker's shop is that if you intend to resaw tops and backs, what I mean by that is take a large billet of whatever wood, let's just say it's rosewood, that you plan on cutting your backs and sides from, or maybe just your backs. Um, if you plan on using that large billet of wood to strip off thin plates to be later joined, it is necessary that you have at least a 14-inch bandsaw. Um, that's how bandsaws are described. You'll see 10-inch, 14-inch, and up from there. What they're talking about there is the amount of clearance and basically the minimal height of material that you can pass 
under that blade. And it just so happens that for guitar parts, 14 inches is just barely large enough to cut half of a soundboard or back plate. And as you probably already know, soundboards and back plates are two pieces that are joined together in the middle. So measuring half of your lower bout width and using that to determine the size bandsaw that you need, that's the way to do it. So again, 14 inches or larger is necessary. A small tabletop model will not do for a guitar maker if you intend to resaw. And as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to do everything. So if you don't plan on resawing, then that's fine. Just order book matched pairs from a supplier. And in that case, you can get away with the smaller, less expensive, say, 10-inch model. Another way of getting around the 14-inch requirement is to cut three-piece backs and tops. You don't get the same symmetry of the plates, and it's not the standard or the ideal way of doing things, but it's a workaround. So you can't really talk about a woodworking shop of any kind without talking about the table saw. However, with guitar makers, the table saw really does, I think, take a back seat to a lot of other tools, like I mentioned the bandsaw and your thickness sanding equipment and things like that. Because we deal with much smaller parts than one would deal with in general woodworking, the table saw is less important and uh, really receives less use. So you actually can save some money here. There's an opportunity for that. My table saw is a 15 amp, 10 inch job site table saw. So it's one of those uh, mobile table saws that you can stow under your bench or really it's designed to be thrown in the back of my truck and taken to a job site, which of course I don't do. Although on occasion I've done something like that and taken it outside just to keep the mess down in the shop or to work on something around the house or on the chicken coop. But for my guitar making purposes, it really is just nice to have something that doesn't take up a lot of space. I've often thought about getting a better table saw, but every time I think about that, I always stop myself because this job site table saw that I have really works fine for my purposes. There's actually nothing else I'm asking from my table saw. I upgraded the blade to a nicer blade, and I think that's a really good tip for, gu for a guitar maker on a budget is to just get an inexpensive table saw and get a nice blade for it. Diablo and Frude both make really nice table saw blades. I think that's how you pronounce Frude. Maybe it's Freud. I'm not really sure. I have bought a second table saw that I have just collecting dust in the corner right now at the moment that I plan on at some point in the future dedicating just for fret slotting because similar to my two bandsaw thing that I have going on, having a second table saw that I can just dedicate the fret slotting would be nice because it would save me time in the setup of swapping out the blade and setting the height and making sure everything's square with my fence and all of that for fret slotting. But that's, um, again, another pro-level thing where it's really not that big of a deal to just swap everything out and set it up. So when you're getting started, you'll just do that. Not to mention, fret slots can be cut a variety of ways. You can cut them by hand with a uh, miter box setup and a dovetail saw with a very specific kerf to cut those fret slots. So dedicating a table saw specifically for that is, of course, not for everyone. In my shop, I use the table saw. Aside from fret slotting, I use it for cutting and dimensioning small parts like the blocks, the neck block and the tail block, and for cutting out the brace blanks, which, uh, of course, you have to be... Brace blanks are very small, and so you have to really have an intimate understanding of your table saw and know how to use it safely to do that. But if you've been working with it for a while, you know how to do that. 
I just want to point that out. The table saw is a very dangerous tool. That's why things like saw stop exist. I don't have a saw stop, but it's not a bad idea to invest in that technology. Saw stop, of course, if you haven't heard of it, is something where you, it's really a miracle, where if you, your hand or your finger were to slip in towards the blade, the blade will essentially drop down into the chassis of the table saw and it will self-destruct actually the blade will destroy itself in this process but your finger will be saved if you haven't heard of this check it out um, there's many youtube videos on it it's really cool and really all professional shops that have issues with liability have all upgraded to this saw stop technology the only reason i don't use it with having students in the shop is because we just literally um, through the process of my class that I teach the students never use the table saw anyway so really the table saw is just a tool for my hands only Okay, next we'll talk about your thicknessing equipment. So this is a tricky one for a lot of people because really your only options go from expensive to more expensive to extremely expensive. So uh, that is if, uh, if you're not doing it by hand with a hand plane, which is a valid alternative. But um, if you're doing this for the long run, it's simply better to invest in a piece of equipment that will help you with this extremely laborious task because that's just what it is. So planers, drum sanders, and industrial thickness sanders are your options here. And the way that these work is you're actually likely going to use a combination of this equipment because if you get a planer, the planer will only be able to thickness your material down to about an eighth of an inch. Beyond that, well, one, your planer should have a stop that actually prevents you from going thinner than an eighth of an inch. Uh, but say if you were to try to cheat that and use, say, a shim board or something like that to push your material up, you would find out that there's a good reason why your planer has this eighth of an inch limitation. And that's because as the material gets hyper, hyper thin to a certain point, um, it can and will actually basically get sucked up into the machine and self-destruct. Self so nobody wants that. The advantage, though, of the planer is that it's going to be your fastest option. It thicknesses material quickly, whereas the drum sander is very slow. It takes ma many, many passes to get it down to its proper thickness. So what I do in my shop is I start on the planer, get it down to an eighth of an inch real quick, and then I slowly bring it down from an eighth of an inch to whatever thickness I require, whether it's a set of sides where I'm bringing it all the way down to 90 thousandths of an inch or even as low as 75 thousandths of an inch, or if it's a back or a top, then I'd be more in the range of 115 thousandths of an inch to 100 thousandths of an inch. Either way, even with the equipment, thicknessing just simply takes time, it's dusty, it's not very fun, and the only way to significantly speed it up is to invest a lot of money into an industrial thickness sander, which works differently than simply a drum sander. A drum sander... Uh, with a drum sander, the grit particles are only ever contacting the wood at one point because of that round drum shape, right? If you really think about it, when you're passing it under there, the sandpaper is only in contact along a single point. An industrial thickness sander works differently with a belt instead of a, a drum, so it removes sands off material a lot quicker. And so if you need to speed things up and you have the money to afford industrial equipment then that's the only way to go so currently i'm using the planer and drum sander combination but i will be uh, 
possibly at the end of this year, investing in a heavy-duty thickness sander like I just talked about. And my research for that has brought me to the Grizzly G9962Z, which is a 24-inch, 10-horsepower wide belt sander. So that may be the way I go, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what the future brings. But anyway, for a large number of the people listening out there, this category of tools is going to most likely be the category of tools that you're going to want to skip. I mean, maybe you could buy a planer. There are definitely some inexpensive models of planers out there that work just fine. Uh, Drum sanders, however, are hard to find and they're expensive. I actually built my own homemade drum sander. But either way, I would encourage you to consider either buying your material pre-thicknessed or finding a woodworking shop in your area that will let you rent time on their thicknessing equipment. Okay, we're going to talk about the various kinds of sanders that you will either need or simply want to have in your shop. So these are tools or pieces of equipment that shape wood through abrasion. Okay, so you have belt sanders, disc sanders, and usually belt and disc sanders, uh, you can buy a piece of equipment that has both on the same motor. So it's a combination belt slash disc sander. There's spindle sanders, edge sanders. Um, Let's actually just talk about those four that I just mentioned because those are the four types of sanders that I use in my shop. The combination disc slash belt sander is the most essential out of all those. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find any kind of woodworking shop that doesn't have a belt sander and a disc sander. Now I have a combination belt slash disc sander. It's a Rikon. It's nice. I like it. If you really want quality though, you can actually buy these separately because often the disc sander on a combination belt slash disc sander is sort of an afterthought. Whereas if you buy a dedicated tool that is just a disc sander, you can get one with a little bit larger of a disc and a little bit larger of a surface for resting your workpiece on. So anyway, I think that's a nice way to go. Although I do like my Rikon uh, combo sander. Now, spindle sanders are something that is not, I wouldn't call it required. There's definitely ways to get around not having a spindle sander. And a lot of builders don't have spindle sanders, but it's the kind of thing where when you get one, you step back and you think, what the hell have I been doing without this tool for this long? At least that was my reaction when I first got my spindle sander. So it is actually one of the shaping tools that sees the most use in my shop, or it is the shaping tool that sees the most use in my shop. I use it for shaping bridges. I use it for rough shaping the headstock. I use it to rough in the heel shape before neck carving. And it sees a lot of use in making templates. And then lastly, there's my edge sander, which is the least essential of all my sanding equipment. I do like it, though. It is great for um, tapering. When I'm roughing out my fretboards and, and tapering the edges, I can do it real quick and accurately on the edge sander. Uh, there's also just a lot of simple, quick steps where I just want to true up a surface and that edge sander that I have is very long and flat and true so it's real easy to get a reliable square edge off of. So if you're just getting started out I would recommend you start with just a combination belt and disc sander and just keep your eye on the spindle sander for a possible future investment but you'd be fine to just have that belt and disc sander starting out. (music) 
Okay, so next we're going to talk about having a router table set up. So of course the router itself is not a stationary tool. You can pull that out and use it in a variety of different contexts, but the router table itself is a fixed position tool. So it fits our definition of equipment here. And you can, most people build themselves a router table. You can even build it directly into your workbench um, or you can build it as a standalone unit that you can stow away. But you can also actually simply buy a router table. And the ones that they have on the market are actually pretty good and they come with uh, some nice features like sliding feather boards and fence, sliding fences and things like that. I have two router tables, one that I purchased and one that I built myself. And I like them both for the two different contexts that I use them for. The one router table that I have, the one that I purchased, I have permanently set up for routing the truss rod slot. That's the only job that that router table does. The other router table setup that I have has a flush trim router bit installed on it for uh, pattern routing. And what I mean by that is routing against a template. Now, I used to shape a lot of things on the router table setup that I have with the flush trim bit on it. I would shape headstocks, I would shape bridges, and you can do that. But in recent times, I've switched over to doing those tasks on the robo sander attached to a drill press, which I'll talk about when we get to the drill press. But I just wanted to mention this because the router, much like the table saw, is a very dangerous tool. And I've learned to use it as little as possible. So I only use it for the least cantankerous of woods, like soft woods and plywood for molds and templates and things like that. That's not to say that you can't use it for harder woods and, and exotic tropical woods. Um, it's just a cantankerous beast. It really is. It, it's a little unpredictable. Even when you're doing everything right, it can just get a little angry with you. So in difficult situations with less than ideal grain direction or very hard tropical woods, it's good to have other options so that you don't have to always fall back on the router table. So this is where having a spindle sander, like I mentioned earlier, is really good because the spindle sander can often replace what you're doing uh, with that pattern routing, especially a spindle sander in combination with a robo sander. Again, we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, so let's talk about the drill press. First of all, you don't actually need a drill press if you're just starting out. You can substitute that effectively with just a handheld drill. You're going to sacrifice accuracy, and on top of that, you're missing out on a lot of interesting applications that the drill press can be used for that um, you just can't get with a handheld drill. There's a lot of attachments that go beyond simply drilling that you can attach to a drill press, which obviously you wouldn't be able to do with just a handheld drill. Uh, one example, we talked about thicknessing earlier. One example is the safety planer, safety planer, however you say that, which actually I should have mentioned that in that section because that is another alternative to all of that expensive thicknessing equipment. Um, it's hard to describe exactly what the safety planer is and how it works uh, in audio here, but um, if you, you look that up, uh, you'll, you'd get a very good idea of how it can substitute for some of those larger and more expensive tools like the drum sander. Another interesting application of the drill press is using abrasive drums, and the ones that I like to use are called the robo sander, funny enough, it's kind of a weird name, but... All it really is is a drum with an abrasive sleeve on it, which has a flush trim 
bearing on it. So it is effectively the abrasive version of a flush trim router bit. So it's way safer than dealing with the cantankerous nature of a router bit. Instead, you are dealing with sandpaper. The obvious drawback there being that it goes way slower, so you have to be patient with it, than uh, you would experience using a flush trim router bit. Also, the Robo Sander does not get things perfectly flush. There's really like uh, just a couple thousandths of an inch of extra material hanging outside whatever your template is that you're shaping around. But it's such a small amount of material that it's never a problem. And if you wanted to remove that excess material, you could then, after working it on the Robo Sander, you could then take it to your flush trim router bit and um, just take that last couple thousandths of an inch off with the with the router bit. But anyway, what your drill press is primarily used for in the context of guitar making is drilling tuner holes and bridge pin holes accurately and square. And as I mentioned before, when you're just starting out, you can get by doing this with a handheld drill and just drilling as square and accurately as you can manage. And last on my list here is the jointer. And I saved this for last because really the jointer is probably the least necessary of all these tools. You really can easily get by without a jointer, especially if you have a shooting board for jointing edges. So what do I mean by jointing edges? So what a jointer does is it gives you a square edge. You have an infeed table that is square to your fence and an outfeed table that is also square to your fence but is slightly lower than the infeed table and the rotating blades are between the two tables so when you press your workpiece up against the fence and pass it over the blade it will plane that side so that it is square to its adjacent side. So the jointer really is all about squaring up stock and it's really only used in the very early stages in the rough milling stages of your parts before you start cutting out say uh, neck blanks or brace blanks from large billets of wood it makes sense to get that billet nice and dimensioned and square on all its faces and the jointer sometimes in combination with a planer and a table saw can do that Okay, and that's all the time I have for today. Um, I hope this helps. I hope you guys now feel like you're armed with a little more knowledge and advice on selecting this equipment. And I want to leave you with one last piece of advice, and that's that you really don't have to, and you probably shouldn't, purchase all the equipment that you think you need right up front. It's much more practical, in my opinion, to just research and select the pieces of equipment that you need as you're going through the process of, say, your first build. It's a lot more manageable that way, and you don't run the risk of purchasing tools or equipment that, in the long run, you don't actually need. Okay, take care out there, guys, and good luck. If you enjoyed this and you learned something here, Please subscribe and leave a review on whatever platform that you are enjoying this on at the moment. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com. Or you can register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania. Bye for now.